Good afternoon, everybody. It's really uh, a privilege to be here. Um, I was just thinking as I was standing there, it's been a long time since I've spoken anywhere else other than my own church. Um, that's not because I never get invited. I want up for my own self-security there. I get asked all the time. That's not quite true. But I used to get asked a lot because I was an itinerant speaker. I used to work for Oasis Trust and um, I was a card-carrying evangelist because on my card it said evangelist. It said Dave said evangelist. I didn't give that card out very often, it has to be said. Um, but that was my kind of job and I used to go and speak at colleges and at universities and at church weekends like this. And then... Um, I, I just hated doing it and then going away again. And I remember speaking to my sort of spiritual director at the time and talking about that. And they said, you, you know why that, though, don't you, Dave? Because you have a pastor's heart. You want to be in one place and you want to work with one group of people. And uh, so that's what happened. And I, I left doing that, speaking around the place, and went to work in a church in Watford. And then I worked for a church in Luton and in London and now in Brighton. And I do get asked to speak other things, and I generally say no. And I can't really remember why I said yes to this, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> Not that I'm regretting it, um, but, but uh, I think it was because you, you were close by, and in fact I know that there are some links between this church and between either Gloucester Place or Florence Road in Brighton. Just put your hand if you have any vague link, or if you know of Florence Road or Gloucester Place Baptist Church in Brighton. A number of people, uh, uh, because I know there are some, because various people say, oh, make sure you say hello to such and such, and I can't remember anybody I'm supposed to say hello to. So if I say hello to everybody for, on behalf of our church, um, then that's uh, uh, just about covered me. But um, there's something about working in your locality and loving those people that really brings me to life. Uh, to come somewhere like here scares me a lot actually because I don't know you, I don't really know what to expect, I don't really know where you're at as individuals or as a church and so it sort of weighs heavily on me one of the few things that I still say yes to when I get asked uh, is to spring harvest and uh, having various people around the room who I think will go and meet you at spring harvest uh, again memories come flooding back, generally quite bad memories because I feel like uh, God has given me this gift um, of always sort of managing to get there in the end, but never without messing up once or twice. You know, I feel like I've never been given the gift of slickness. I look at some of these preachers and they're slick and their PowerPoint always works. We've just about managed to get mine to work today. And there's always something that goes wrong. And at Spring Harvest, every year I could tell you a story. I've probably been doing Spring Harvest for, uh, I know, 20 years. And for every year I've done it, something goes wrong. Uh, the first year I ever spoke at Spring Harvest, I was working in this youth team and uh, I was really in the sort of pleb ranks of kind of didn't really know why I was there certainly wasn't being paid to be there uh, I'd have paid to have gone and I'm serving on this youth team leading a small group of people but looking on the stage thinking, oh, that's where I'd like to be uh, the irony now is I'm on the stage and wishing I'd like to be uh, there 20 years later but that's what I really wanted to sort of do and at, they don't do this anymore at Spring Harvest thank goodness but 20 years ago at the end of the youth week uh, all the young people would gather around and they'd take pictures of the youth team. It's a bit embarrassing looking back. But worse than that, they would bring you their Bibles for you to sign their Bibles. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> but that was kind of normal. And so uh, there's me in this venue, and I've got all these young people coming up saying, sign, Will you sign my Bible? Will you sign my Bible? And not only do you sign it, but you sign it with some encouraging message, and then you put a Bible verse and there's me, this incredibly wet behind the ears sort of youth worker guy didn't really know my Bible at all and I, the only thing I can think of is John 3.16 someone had already taken that oh how dare they, I can't think of any other Bible verses and they're going, you know, write something, I've got this pen in my hand there's a queue of people what should I write, I've got to write a Bible verse and then I remembered the verse from my baptism and it said this, do not let anybody look down on you because you are young but to set an example to the believers in life, in faith, in love and speech, and in purity. 2 Timothy 4 verse 12. Brilliant. I write it, hundreds of Bibles, 2 Timothy 4 verse 12. What encouraging verses to these young people they're going to be. Get on this minibus, and we're driving back, and I'm thinking about the experience. And then I suddenly have a thought. Is it 2 Timothy 4? <laughs> verse 12. That verse. I thought... I think it's 1 Timothy 4 verse 12. I look, 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 says, Do not let anybody look down on you because you're young. 
I turn with trepidation to think, what have I written in all of these people's Bibles to Timothy 4? I'm not really nervous because the Bible's good stuff, isn't it? You know, and Paul's letters to Timothy are some of the most practical, inspiring stuff. I can't get, it, it might be even better. It might be even more inspiring. You can look it up yourself. I promise you the entirety of 2 Timothy 4 verse 12 is this. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. <laughs> You know, that, that really stretches that all of the Bible is useful for teaching and all of that. Uh, I still think there's a whole generation of young people who have moved to Ephesus, you know, and, uh, because of me. And so I don't doubt today I'll say some stupid things uh, and things won't go quite right. But I hope the heart of what I want to share with you is right. And I have to confess with you, um, when I saw it coming up in my diary, and Joe, wherever Joe is, has been brilliant at very kindly chasing me and, and keeping me up to date with what the plans were for this weekend. I thought, I know what I'll do. You know, life's busy, I've got so much on. I know that actually I won't have to prepare very much because I've been preaching for a long time. We do all these kind of series and I've got some passages and some bits of the Bible that I'm, I'm red hot on and I love. And I could turn up now and we could do it and I won't have to prepare. I have to, I'm being honest with you, okay. So the months start, to, the, this weekend starts to get closer and I have this nagging feeling that none of that stuff I've done before I should speak to you about today. I obviously push that nagging feeling away and just ignore that. Then the week before last I went away on a, I try and go away on a retreat every month for a day and I went to somewhere called Penza, some of you might know up near Ashburnham and I was there and I was praying for you and I was praying for this weekend and uh, I thought to myself, I know what I'll do, I'll pull out the bag, one, two of my favourite books of the Bible that I could preach about all day, every day, the book of Nehemiah and the book of Jonah. And I thought, I basically just thought, which one should I do? Shall I do Nehemiah or shall I do Jonah for you today and tomorrow? And we'll talk about that and I'll love it and it'll be great. Again, this deep down sense, don't talk about that and don't go with something you've spoken about before. Pushed it to the side. Not very long ago, I thought, like I'm talking a few days ago, if I'm being honest, I went on your website and I thought, I'll just have a little look, see what stuff that's been preached on recently in the life of Victoria Baptist Church. I don't know how recent it was, but on your media page, front page, teaching series, boom, Jonah, boom, Nehemiah. Ah! I can't speak on something that they've spoken on. Was that recently? Or relatively recently? So I'm not going to speak on Nehemiah or Jonah, which is a shame for me and might turn out to be a shame for you too, because I wanted to speak about something that I'm not sure I've ever so specifically wanted to ask a group of people. As I prayed for you, and as I prayed about today, there was quite a specific question that came to mind that felt extremely uh, blunt, quite aggressive, and I sort of thought, I'm really not going to go with that. It would just be nice to be nice. And we can look at a passage of the Bible together and we'll do our best job that I can do. And the best scenario is I go away on Sunday afternoon and people say, wasn't that Dave still a nice guy? Some lovely Bible teaching we had. That's a very tempting thing to desire. But this is the question and you'll see why I would like to really avoid it. This is the question that I want everybody to think about. And I think it's the question that if a guest speaker was coming into my church for a weekend, I would really love them to ask. Because when you're a local leader, you're in for the marathon. You know, we talk about stuff in incremental ways. We nudge people towards Christ. We, the, the method of discipleship in our church, and I guess in every church, is about loving one another, relating to one another. The gradual marathon of slowly, over your lifetime, becoming more like Christ. What occasionally I would like, and it's very difficult to do when you have to get up the next morning and still be part of the church, I would like to challenge people with more of a sledgehammer approach of what are you doing with your life? That's the question that we're going to think about for the rest of today. And I hope you hang on in there, and I hope you have the courage to ask yourself genuinely, what am I doing with my life? I wonder if I ask you to form an orderly queue and take the microphone I'm not going to do that. It would take far too long, and many of you would run for the doors if you've got any sense. But what are you doing with your life? This one life that you've been given, what are you actually doing with it? Not what do you believe, not even particularly where are you at with God. I, I want to know what you're doing with your life. None of us know how long our lives are going to be exactly, but what are you doing 
with yours, today, here and now? What's your life counting for? What difference are you making? How much are you really living? Because the, if you've got a Bible near you, um, or you can look at the screen, I guess, because it's working, is uh, these verses in 1 Timothy 6, definitely 1 Timothy, not 2 Timothy, because there aren't six chapters of 2 Timothy, uh, but in 1 Timothy 6, I think Paul says something very interesting to his young friend Timothy. And I love 1 Timothy as well, it's a great book. And right at the end, these verses come out. He says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. If that other question was... See, I, did, I told you this would happen. <laughs> if that other question was slightly too aggressive for you, then maybe the other question that you might want to consider is, do you know life that is truly life? Because from that statement that Paul says, it's clear that there are two ways of living. There is one way of living that at its best looks like this. That all of your desires are met, that you're not hungry, that you have enough clothes to wear, that you have a shelter over your head, that you have friendships that are good, that uh, if your marriage or marriage is a good one, that you have a job that you find fulfilling, that you have enough money in the bank to be able to do the things that you want to, that that is just about the best that's on offer that the world can give you. That satisfaction of having the things that you want. And if you had everything you want, the best that the world has to offer is that that is life. My family, we have this uh, sort of in little phrases, I don't know where they've come from, uh, they've become little cliches that, that I've got two children, Jake and Raya, and a boy and a girl, and one wife, and uh, the four of us, um, we love each other and we hang out together, and we have these little sayings that we have to each other, and uh, they would, they'd be so shocked that I'm telling you this, I wouldn't tell my own, own church this, but we have our little sort of in-house cliches, and one of them is this, whenever we're anywhere vaguely luxurious... You know, if we're on holiday and we are sitting in a, a hot tub or something, or we're sitting on a beach, anywhere, one of my kids will turn to me and say, Dad, this is the life. <laughs> it's become this little cliche. And in fact, on Father's Day, they bought me this little wooden plaque that said, this is the life, that's gone up in our, in our kitchen. This is the life. And whilst those moments are beautiful and brilliant, imagine the thought of me and my Family, my two kids who I love so much, you know, on, on a beach somewhere and the sun's out and I'm not working and it's just one of those moments and the kids say, this is the life. It, it is the life, but that's the best that the world can offer you. In that moment, that's the best. But Paul says to Timothy, I want to talk to you about life that is truly life. Jesus famously says, I've come that you might have life, and life in all its fullness. That there is an element of your life and my life, that there is a different way of understanding life that is better than anything that life can bring. Does that make kind of sense to you? And especially if you've been part of, a long, a part of church for a long time, you'll know this stuff. I know that you know it, but are you living it? Do you have life that is truly life? Do you have life that is life in all its fullness? Because it's my absolute belief that when we talk about salvation, that's the image that we should have. For too many of us, we feel that salvation is something that happens to us after we die. That our salvation is about sealing for us this bonus, but it's a massive bonus, of that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. That's essentially the gospel for a lot of people. I think that that's our, what our PR job has done to people outside the church. I think if you were to stop people in Eastbourne Town Centre and say, what is the benefit of being a Christian? They probably wouldn't say, oh, church membership, you know, <laughs> quiche, 
and bad coffee. You know, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what they would say. I'm sure that you don't have that here. But what's the benefit of being a Christian? People out there would say, well, if you believe it, I guess the benefit is that you go to heaven. I wonder if, if you hang on in there because actually that is the benefit for you. I think salvation is something much richer, much deeper, and is beginning right here now today. It's life in its fullness before life in its fullness after death. Life before death. That whole life salvation from top to bottom. Salvation actually translates as being whole. For you to be whole, full of life, fully alive. That's God's goal and aim for every single person here. There was a thing that came out, some of you might have seen it. And it is a slightly depressing thing, as you'll see from the title of the slide. Regrets of the dying. (laughs) It's not going to be the cheeriest PowerPoint slide you've ever seen in your life, whatever comes up next. Um, But it was done by a palliative care nurse in uh, Australia who had 20 years of being at the bedside of people in the last days of their life. And she decided to write up the top five things that people say to her in the dying moments of their life. I think it's fascinating and really revealing. And this is what she says. The fifth most popular one was, I wish that I had let myself be happier. Isn't that an interesting phrase? You can go online and look at it. She expands it. It's fascinating what she says. That most of my life was, was trying to get happiness in a box when actually I wish I just had the freedom to be happy, to laugh more, to give myself permission for a likeness in my spirit. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. She said that was uh, mainly men at that point in their lives. He said, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. That felt like I was implying there that no woman ever thinks she's ever worked hard. <laughs> Probably because men moan about it more, I imagine. But um, the number one thing is this. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I find such sadness in those regrets. And I'm not pointing any fingers this morning, I'm pointing them really at me. And I'd like you to do the same. Not at anybody else, but I'd like you to ask yourself the questions that if this was your last moment, what would your regrets be? I, I, uh, when I was growing up, every youth talk seemed to involve a runaway bus that was about to run you over. Have you ever heard those talks? Every youth talk used to be, if a bus ran you over tonight... That's really weird, especially in the church I grew up, his little brethren church, in a one-way street, the buses never came up our road. <laughs> what was the bus doing up there? And it was a really narrow street, I don't know how it would, would, get, would get up there. Um, but it was always, if a bus knocked you over tonight, do you know where you would go? Again, subconsciously, I drunk in as a child going to church... The importance of my salvation, the importance of knowing Christ in my life, is because you never know when your life's going to end. Salvation says, on this day, your life is really beginning. Completely different way around. Uh, last weekend, or the weekend before last, we had our church weekend away. We just such a fun time. A place called Dale's Down. Do you ever go that far? West, you've never heard of it, have you? Uh, that's the kind of place where everyone, all the Brighton churches go away for weekends away. You'll probably go to Ashburn and Posher. Um, and, and Dale's Down uh, is this lovely place and had this great time there. But I, I, I went there and I stood in this bit in this corridor, a really funny moment where you know, just suddenly a memory comes back to you. And I remembered I'd stood in this exact spot years and years and years ago on a youth weekend where I was invited to be the speaker. Back in the days when I was speaking lots of things, to the point where every Christian retreat centre, they all merge into one, and you don't even know where you are. But I, as I stood there, I, I had this little flashback moment, to standing outside my dormitory door, and I thought, oh yeah, it was here. This was that place. The reason I remember it was because it was about midnight, the last session had finished, most of the, children, the, the kids there were supposed to be in bed, some of the older ones are sort of coming in from a campfire or something, they're going into their dorms, and this one girl comes up to me. 
and says, can I ask you something? I'm just about to go to bed. Everything inside me is saying, no, you can't. I'm trying to go to bed. On the outside, though, I'm a lovely man. And I said, yeah, yeah, go for it. She said, uh, what would you do if you got to the end of your life and there wasn't heaven? And I said, what? She said, what would happen if you were dead and you realised there wasn't heaven? I said, how could I be dead and realise there wasn't a heaven? You know, what a strange question. She said, do you know what I mean? I said, yeah, I do know what you mean. And uh, she said, well, what would you do? Her implication was this, as I later found out. She's thinking about giving her life to Christ. She's been challenged on this weekend. But she doesn't want to go for it and have this dull, safe life and go to church every week and do all that Christian stuff if you don't get heaven at the end of it. That's what she's implying. So she said to me, seriously, what would you do if there wasn't a heaven? And I said, uh, very unlike me, I'm a spontaneous sort of person, I said, uh, let me sleep on it. <laughs> she went, you're not a very good Christian leader. I, I said, let me sleep on it, because I thought it was actually an interesting question. So I went to bed and I lay there and I thought, I wonder if there's no heaven. So I got up the next morning, found her at breakfast, sat down next to her. I said, I thought about it. She said, yeah. I said, I don't care. She went, what? I said I wouldn't care. And the look on her face was like, Where's, who organised this weekend? We need to get rid of this guy because he's not a proper Christian. I said, I thought about it through the night and I honestly came to the conclusion I wouldn't live my life any different today. Because her implication was that you have to do something that's dull and lacking in life now in order to get life eternally. That's not the gospel, is it? That is not the gospel. That life begins now and life begins in all its fullness Churches should be places of life and energy and joy. That should be our reputation. Is it our reputation? No. I think it's tragic. And I think it probably is the work of Satan. How we've managed to somehow turn a message that this is about life. It's about the inclusive love of God, whose arms are open wide to everybody. Who says, come into the banquet, come to the feast, come to the party. No life in all its fullness. And yet people out there, firstly believe they're not welcome. Think that they'll be judged. And think, why would I want to give away the life that I enjoy to join a church? Why would I want to hang out with Christians? Especially a Baptist church. They're the worst sort. <laughs> Why would I do that? How did we manage to turn the message? In fact, this is, this is just a memory came back to me. I went to see a, a comedian called Eddie Izzard some years ago in a church in North London that was no longer a church. And he did his comedy routine from a pulpit. And he walked up into the pulpit and everybody cleared, clapped. And his opening lines were this. He said, well, why does God have all the best venues? Which was a funny opening line. Everybody laughed. And then he, he stood and he looked around and he said, how did they manage to take the teaching of the grooviest, his word not mine, the grooviest, most fantastic man who's ever lived and turn it in to mumbling in a stone cold building? Everybody laughed. I didn't laugh because I thought he's telling us some truth here. How have we turned this message of life? Of coming into the presence of God with heaven beginning now, not waiting until I'm dead. And my challenge to you, and I deliberately want to provoke you today, is are you living life that is full? Are you knowing life that is truly life? As I was driving over here today, I thought about there's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 47 where the prophet gets this vision of uh, the temple and he's led around it and there's this really amazing bit where it says that, he t that he's taken through the south door of the temple and there's water running under the door and he's taken into the temple and then the bit that as I drove over and I thought about was this it says then I was taken out of the north door so he leaves from a different door than he came in you think what a strange thing to point out you know, I think our churches are badly designed. I think we should always leave by a different door than the door we came in. Because the point of the prophecy, this picture that Ezekiel had, was that you've come into this presence, this special place, and you can't go out the same way that you came in. 
And the message in Ezekiel is about this river that flows, and it flows from the south door out under the north door, and, it, and as he steps out into it, it gets deeper and deeper, until he can't even stand because of the force of the water. And the image is of this. If he'd turned around and gone back out the door that he'd come in through, he'd be going back out into the shallow. But because he decides to go out a different way, in other words, he goes out as a different person, he goes into real depth, he goes into a new flow. I wonder, Ian, if we could make that happen by the end of today, knock a door through, is that all right? Um, imagine if, if instead of coming in that door, turning back out and going out the door, just we all decided to go out through, I don't know where that goes, but imagine we all decided it would be a real pain, but it would be such a powerful illustration that I'm not going to leave this room the same person that I came into the room. And when we come into the presence of God and we come together as church, we should always be leaving differently. I know that might sound like a strange thing to say, but it's an obvious thing to say, because why bother coming then? Why bother coming in and joining together like this if we're just going to leave the same people that we came in? If we're just going to go back out the same door? If we're just going to paddle in the stream of God that we paddled into? How many people here, I know for me, I want to leave this place feeling like I've gone deeper into him. Feeling like I know more of his life that's around me. I want to know life in all its fullness. Today I want to challenge you to think about your life. How you're living it. What are you doing with it? Are you beginning to feel like salvation is seeping into your life right now? Are you seeing heaven come into your life now. I was going to use a piece of a video um, that I found massively challenging and maybe it's too long to have showed you anyway so maybe it's a good thing that I can't play it to you. But just a few weeks ago one of my real spiritual heroes I guess died, a guy called Dallas Willard and he wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy and for me it was one of the first kind of properly more challenging theological books that I read and uh, it really messed with my head and it was this very... Uh, dense book that I hadn't read anything like that before, later went on to do uh, further study and, and it wouldn't be seen as quite so difficult now for me, but it was certainly then. And, and this guy Dallas Willard, and not only is a really interesting writer, but I know some people who know him and everybody who knows him uh, just speaks so highly of him. This godly man who has time for people and one of my best friends is part of a, a group that Dallas Willard's part of and he just, just every time he says, oh, I just got to spend some time with Dallas. Just what a guy, you just come away feeling enriched, you just come away feeling like you're coming to some, a, a significant man of God. And he died just a few weeks ago. And the last interview that he ever did, or the last talk that he ever did, was being interviewed on stage. He couldn't really stand up, the guy's riddled with cancer at that point. And he gives his last public appearance. And he talks about what it will be like to die. And he says this most incredible thing that took me weeks of like trying to get my head round. That he said some people who have lived their lives well, who know life in all its fullness, are going to die and not know they've died. Do you, do you see the point he was making? That they've managed to begin to life, live life in all its fullness so much now that the moment of death, he says, you'll notice something's different. But it won't be so obvious. Because you know the fullness of life now, the promise of what we're going to get. And when I listened to that, I thought, I wonder what it would be like for me to die now. Because the reality is, it would be a jarring difference. Because I don't know life in all its fullness, but I want to. And over the course of my life, I want to get deeper and deeper into that living in life in all its fullness. So that the moment I get to be fully in the presence of God, actually I've been living my life fully in the presence of God. So the difference is more subtle. Does that make sense? Yeah. What an exciting vision for your life. That all of the mess that we know now, somehow we iron out as we walk with God to become more like Christ so that we enter into his presence. And the thing that I want you to think about, and it's dangerous whenever we meet as a group, is, is we do this thing where we transfer all the time and we end up thinking, it's an interesting thought, but he's not talking to me. I am talking to you because I want, in the next couple of sessions, to think about you and your life. Specifically, who you are, where God's put you, what your talents are, what your passions are. <coughs> and are you understanding that salvation in you now? 
you might have heard this statistic before, but in 1977, when Elvis died, if indeed he did, <laughs> there, were, there were nine impersonators. In the year 2000, there were 485,000 Elvis impersonators. If you carry on that sort of growth, in the year 2050, one in five of us will be an Elvis impersonator. (laughs) There will be more Elvis impersonators on the planet than there are people in China today. Look around, who's the most likely to turn into (laughs) an Elvis impersonator? I think one of the great myths of discipleship and becoming like Jesus, because it's phrases that we hear all the time, it might be controversial, but let, just to see whether this makes sense to you, is that I think we're supposed, the best that we're supposed to do, the thing that we're beaten up over, is that my life is supposed to be an impersonation of Jesus. You see those, what would Jesus do, wristbands? Every decision I ever make, I ask myself, what would Jesus do? So that the best that God wants for me, what he hopes for me, is that I become like a good impersonation of Jesus. I don't think it's true. I think the impersonation that you should be striving for is to be you. The very best you that you can be. And you might think, well that sounds a bit humanist, I'm not really sure about that. I I am sure about it. I absolutely believe that Jesus wants to walk with you and to help you be the best you that you can be. Because in church life, I think very often we feel like we're all heading to the same point. That we all become like Jesus and that image of Jesus that we have, we expect it of others. We expect that actually we're giving up our personalities, we're giving up our giftings, we're giving up our passions for this kind of fairly horrible, middle of the road, nice, Jesus type person, who would fit right into the middle of Victoria Baptist. He's a bit like Ian. <laughs> I don't know Ian well enough to be, how, how rude I can be too. But, but, I, but I'll flip it back to my church. For goodness sake, if the church's best model of what, what somebody who looks like Jesus is, is me, and they're trying to be like me, then we're all in big trouble. Because I need to become fully like me. And every person in my church needs to have the freedom to become fully like themselves. The people that God has spent so much time on crafting and giving certain gifts to and creating, he wants you to be here. A very one of the early uh, Christian uh, church fathers, Irenaeus, said this: "The glory of God is a person fully alive. The glory of God is a person who is fully alive. That's the best thing that you can do. Be you, fully alive. That's how you honour people. One of my favourite little quotes is John Wesley." was going around the country preaching to crowds of thousands and thousands of people. And people were trying to be like him. He cha- I've seen it actually in the UK. I've seen preachers who rise up and suddenly you realise every preacher who's younger and coming up, they start to have the same mannerisms. They start to wear the same clothes. There is a certain sort of Steve Chalk, South London, flick your hair thing. I've never been able to do that, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the, that, that happened certainly in my generation. People have this, and, and that's what I want to be like. Well, people were saying that to John Wesley. I want to be like John Wesley. They're all buying up horses, and <laughs> I made that bit up. But they, they, they're wanting to draw the thousands by being like him until eventually somebody sits him down and says, Come on then, what is it that you've got that we haven't? How do you draw these tens of thousands of people to come and listen to you preach? And Wesley said, It's simple. I set myself on fire, and people come to watch me burn. It's quite a statement, isn't it? Sounds incredibly arrogant. I've learned to think that that's one of the most beautiful, humble things to say. That God wants me to be fully me. And when I'm at my best, when I'm on fire, people will be drawn to Christ through me. 
If your passion is mission, or your passion is discipleship, or your passion is working with children and young people, or your passion is for other parts of the world, or whatever your passion is, the best way you can serve that is for you to become fully alive and on fire. And I meet lots of people in my church who I love and I think God desperately wants to use, but they have no concept that he's talking to them. They've joined our church because they appreciate what we're doing and some of that reflected glory is actually bouncing off the fact that he's interested in you and your calling and your gifting. And that's what we're going to talk about through the rest of today. So thank you for staying with me in this first part. And uh, we're going to have a break for some refreshments, I think. <laughs>